Like the American Revolution, which led in both pro-slavery and anti-slavery directions, her story has tragic dimensions. Patrons solicited her and failed her. She didn't earn a living and she died young. Politics and war victimized Phyllis Wheatley and may have disillusioned her, but there is little reason to imagine that she had illusions of lasting fame, glory, long life, or wealth. Both representative and one of a kind, like any life, but especially the lives of artists and activists who fascinate and become lightning rods. Her story tells us much about slavery, about race, and about how both were made and remade with the American Revolution. Her own history demonstrates that the American Revolution both strengthened and limited black slavery. She helped make it so. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, Boston Public Library, and the Museum of African American History, ably produced by GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors, NEHGS, and producer of the American Inspiration Series. Now, turning to tonight's speakers, it is my pleasure to introduce our featured author. David Wallstreicher teaches history at the City University of New York Graduate Center and is the author of Slavery's Constitution, From Revolution to Ratification, and also the book Runaway America, Benjamin Franklin, Slavery, and the American Revolution. He has written for, among other publications, the New York Times, Boston Review, and The Atlantic. Now, for more introductions, over to you, Kristen. Thank you, Margaret. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, welcome everyone. I'm Kristen Motti from the programs team here at the library. Tonight, I have the honor of sharing a bit of information about Lamurchi Frazier, our moderator for the conversation this evening. Lamurchi Frazier is a visual artist, historian, and and innovator, poet, and holographer. Frazier is executive director of creative and strategic planning for the Boston-based Spoke Art and formerly director of education and interpretation for the Museum of African American History, Boston and Nantucket. Frazier is an award-winning national and international visual and performance artist and poet. Her collected works are in the Smithsonian, the White House, Minneapolis Institute of Art and the Dallas Museum of Art. Her work supports the dialogues that concern social justice and restore, restoration, civil rights and human rights. We'll meet Lamurchi shortly. Now with a welcome from the Museum of African American History, please join me in welcoming Christian Walks. Christian, over to you. Thank you, Kristen. On behalf of the Museum of African American History, it is my honor to welcome today's author, Professor David Waldstreicher. Professor Waldstreicher, we look forward to your invaluable insight you will provide this evening. And without further ado, I would like to hand it over to you, our featured author this evening, Professor Waldstreicher. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm going to read a bit from the first chapter, the introductory chapter, the very beginning of the book, um, and uh, to, give a, to give a taste and also uh, to provide a jumping off point for our conversation. And I'm going to time myself so that I don't go over. So let me just start my stopwatch. Chapter one, the beginnings, the table, the tale. Everyone around Boston knew about the storm at the end of August 1767. They knew what could happen in gales on the back of Cape Cod. Still, even after years in the coastal trade, the Nantucket merchants Hussey and Coffin had rarely felt such winds. By the grace of God, their schooner and their whale oil had made it safely to a Boston wharf, and they had returned to the fine house of their fellow trader, John Wheatley. The girl came with bowls, with bread. She did not sit at the table, but she listened. The Wheatleys already knew about her ear. The girl had some sort of gift. 
John's wife, Susanna, and their daughter, 18-year-old Mary, who had a twin brother but no living sisters, had taught her to read English. It wasn't hard. Soon after they purchased her off the slave ship Phyllis in 1761, they had noticed her endeavoring to make letters upon the wall with a piece of chalk or charcoal. Four years later, the 12-year-old penned an impressive letter to a Mohegan missionary who had stayed in their home. She had also written elegies about the deaths of respected men and, men and verse appeals to lapsed Christians that the Wheatleys showed to their friends and neighbors. The poem Phyllis began to write soon after that dinner, the first she published, addressed the near wreck and the Nantucket merchants. The occasion was standard stuff, especially in Massachusetts. Almost half a century earlier, an even younger Bostonian, the 12-year-old apprentice named Benjamin Franklin, had published a ballad broadside about a capsized rowboat and the drowning of a family and their enslaved man. Less conventionally, Phyllis addressed Hussey and Coffin directly in her poem. She asks rhetorical questions about their peril. Did fear and danger so perplex your mind as made you fearful of the whistling wind? It's not a dialogue. She doesn't quote their answers. She speaks of them, about them, to some larger purpose. They may be the subjects along with the awesome elements, but the voice is clearly hers. It isn't hard to imagine why the survivor of a slave ship could identify with another terrifying voyage, with voyagers who wondered whether the punishing winds were themselves alive, as she put it, was it not Boreas knit his angry brow against you? And whether the stormy emotions of gods would doom or deliver, save or destroy. But enslaved girls were not encouraged to speak of those voyages. She begins riskily then, as well as suddenly in the gales and the waves, throwing us into the action aboard the boat. How did these older men, these merchants, feel? She invokes fear twice. Did they fear so much that even the wind seemed alive? Or as experienced shippers, did their consideration, a double entendre meaning both thought and money, enable them to stay calm, to rationalize how the winds, like God, give as well as take? Apparently not, or it isn't for her to speculate on merchant men's considerations. She returns to the trope of the threatening deities, another wind god. Aeolus was angry, haughty, frowning. She backs off. She depersonalizes in a classical idiom that to modern readers has seemed so off-putting, so scholastic, so white. She reaches back to maritime cultures of the Greeks and Romans, and the most popular of the neoclassical texts translated by the most ambitious English poets of the previous two generations. Her first readers in print in the Newport Mercury of December 21st, 1767, and the Boston Post Boy three weeks later, would have understood instantly. These lines are literally evocative of Homer's Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid in their popular English versions. versions. The Odyssey begins with a call to the muses to sing of Odysseus's unnumbered toils on stormy seas. In Alexander Pope's translation, the ghost of Agamemnon asks similar questions to the ghosts of the ghost of Amphimedon, one of the suitors slain by Odysseus. What cause compelled so many and so gay to tread the downward melancholy way? Did the rage of stormy Neptune sweep your lives at once and whelm beneath the deep? The storm-tossed voyages in Homer are also accompanied by questions about the gods' intentions. Greeks, Romans, Britons, Africans, can they be similar? What might this mean? Did she mean it literally? Did she believe in these gods of the sea, like a pagan, an ancient? Phyllis Wheatley could be talking about herself, imagining herself into the world of the poem as a storm-tossed victim or hero, as voice of the dead, as vessel of the gods. But more importantly, she takes control of the references, the presence of the ancient, for the reader of the newspaper who could not have missed that the poem had been written by a, quote, Negro girl. The preface stresses her race. The poem itself places Africa and her in a shared ancient world that is at once past and present, a place where even she can speak with authority. The boldness of address, the claim to share the ancient world on equal terms, is hidden by the seeming imitation, the classical references. But not enough, not nearly. 
Having established her classical propers, Phyllis switches registers. The pagan deities, she tells the reader, are a metaphor. Regard them not. A Christian salvation is at stake. If Hussey and Coffin had perished in the sea, where would they go? Where would be their abode? With the supreme and independent God? Or made their beds down in the shade below? Christians and Africans, like ancient Mediterraneans, believed in another world where the dead reside. They also equally believed in revelations. The poetic narrative returns then to another tradition, at once classical and Christian, and especially important in early modern Western Christendom, the good death, to be preferred to the godless life full of fear. Are they saved? Are they going down or up? All depends on their faith and, and who does the asking and the telling. Presented as the pious effort of a precocious slave and published in a newspaper, it's a Christian exhortation that demonstrates spiritual equality. Yet the Salvation Project presumes a Greek, Roman, and African world of shipwrecks, slaving, and women. A set of experiences analogous to the world she had known, the stories she couldn't tell to the enslavers who provided the pen and the paper on which she wrote. The classical revival provided her with a way of talking about her experience as an enslaved woman without talking about it directly. In Homer, the traffic in women is perfectly ordinary and yet akin to the original sin, a rupture that makes and unmakes the world. It is the job of the poet to knit the world back together and maybe free herself in the process, like the singer at the end of the Odyssey who receives a pardon perhaps because, in the end, he is as indispensable as the hero. This story of Phyllis Wheatley's Odyssey takes its cues from what she wrote, from what she brought to the table, including the books and newspapers she rewrote into overt and controversial arguments for freedom. It traces her remarkable journey from West Africa to Boston to London and back to America on the eve of the American Revolution. She published the first book in English by a person of African descent and the third book of poetry by a North American woman. The book's existence became an anti-slavery argument and so did some of her poems. Despite being only 19 years old at the time, Wheatley shaped her book's publication and reception. She gained her freedom as a direct result of that project. She was the only black person to elicit personal responses from the likes of Lord Dartmouth, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson. Their public responses mattered because of how the problem of slavery had already come to be part of the imperial controversy. She became, in other words, a political actor as well as an artist and a celebrity. She was an inspired participant in the new movement against slavery and the most famous African in North America and Europe during the era of the American Revolution. Like the American Revolution, which led in both pro-slavery and anti-slavery directions, her story has tragic dimensions. Patrons solicited her and failed her. She didn't earn a living and she died young. Politics and war victimized Phyllis Wheatley and may have disillusioned her, but there is little reason to imagine that she had illusions of lasting fame, glory, long life, or wealth. Both representative and one of a kind, like any life, but especially the lives of artists and activists who fascinate and become lightning rods. Her story tells us much about slavery, about race, and about how both were made and remade with the American Revolution. Her own history demonstrates that the American Revolution both strengthened and limited black slavery. She helped make it so. Wheatley's first published poem begins with five questions. These queries move from the merchant's experience to the mythical gods. They combine the practical, the spiritual, and the mysteriously elusive. A question can be a veiled statement. It can also be an invitation to begin a conversation. Given the right questions, in the right places, in a revolutionary America, poems could be actions. As she wrote in an unfinished epic titled America, sometimes by simile, a victory is won. Thank you. I'll turn it now over to Lamerci Schrader to start our conversation. 
Thank you so much for that reading of your book. It is so profound that um, there's so many questions that I could ask you just based on the passage you read, let alone the multiple, multiple pages that you have dedicated here to the, the selling the story of the life of Phyllis Wheatley. I just want to cue us in on number one, a question of why you chose Phyllis. And secondly, your title of Odyssey. Can you speak to that for us, David? It's just, your book is riveting. And as you read it, you're pulled more and more into this story that is so profoundly rich with not only American history, but this lens to interrogate and to question, why didn't we know more about her before? So I wanna ask you why you chose Phyllis and this question about choosing the word Odyssey. Well, the, the easy answer to the question of why I chose to write this book is that um, the topic is at the confluence of several of my long-term interests as a historian. Uh, the American Revolution and slavery and print culture. Um, and um, and uh, I studied with one, David Brian Davis, one of the great historians of slavery and anti-slavery. Um, and um, so this is the kind of thing that I was, I, I've been rehearsing for, for a long time. So I'm, if it succeeded, I, I'm, I'm very happy because I felt, I, I certainly feel that I couldn't have, um, I don't know if I was ready to write a book like this until until recently. In some ways, in in ways maybe we can talk about it, it was harder than writing about Benjamin Franklin and slavery, which was another topic that no, nobody thought that perhaps a book could be written about because there wasn't so much there. But on the other hand, there's so much Franklin, there's so much written by and about Franklin that that it, in some ways it was it was easier. It was a lot easier to do than than this was. The more personal uh, reason why I chose to write a book about Phyllis Wheatley um, has to do with uh, my um, my mother being a, a poet, and um, though she didn't like to call herself that, and she didn't publish her poetry, uh, it has to do with uh, my long term interest. Uh, my 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 mother. I subsequently found out her her mother and father when they were courting wrote poems to each other. Something I only found out recently. And when I was a student, when I was a young man, I was an aspiring college poet. So uh, I've been interested in and drawn by poetry for a long long time. And and to some ways, this is a return to thing to um, thinking and writing in ways that I uh, haven't always been able to do. So it was a special challenge and a special opportunity. As far as the title goes, uh, the the title is a um, is a in a like many titles are a kind of double entendre. It has a it it means the literal the what we when we say Odyssey we usually mean a voyage uh, and the uh, so I'm referring to her different voyages, uh, her different the changes she went through, and uh, I it wasn't until I um, got myself my um, my self taught. Uh, education in Greek and Roman classics that I undertook to write this book when I realized how important it was to her and uh, uh, that I realized just how resonant that term means and that Odyssey didn't doesn't just mean uh, taking a journey and going somewhere it it, it means uh, it means transformations it means mystery um, and it also means uh, for many of the characters in works by Homer and those Greek and Roman authors, it means sometimes means a, tran a transformation from slavery to freedom or from freedom to slavery. So I thought that it um, I couldn't I really couldn't think of any other title that was that was uh, more appropriate. Well, and in, with that same thought in mind, as we look at Phyllis's spaces that she occupied and they were many and we look at the geography that she covered in those spaces um was there any uh surprising moment for you as you looked at how much territory she was able to cover being a woman in the 17th century being an enslaved 
woman in the, I mean, in the 18th century, being an enslaved woman who is looked upon to actually uh, cast a shadow on some of what we find later with Thomas Jefferson's critique of her in Notes on the State of Virginia. As she traverses and negotiates these spaces, was there anything surprising for you about her methodology and how she used her own uh, wits and her uh, apparent capability and potential of intellect to, to do this? In in some ways, uh, in some ways, Jefferson is a good place to to start with how he uh, refers to her and notes on the state of Virginia because he, and it, it it did shape her image for those who were not sympathetic to refer to her as uh, really uh, as solely a pious poet and as not really learned or um, original, and I. I knew that wasn't the case. And I wrote, I wrote a couple of, I wrote, as I was developing the book, I, I wrote a couple of essays about, about just how involved she is in, in the political debates at the time and how that, uh, and how over time you can see her dealing more, more and more directly with the question of slavery. Uh, but the more I got into it, and there, there's lots of good literary criticism that has called attention to things she read and things that she's riffing on. But the more I the 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 deeper I went, and especially as I read the period newspapers, the more I was struck by how much she's reading and how much she knows about what's going on in Boston, but also well beyond well beyond. Um, so I tried so I tried to read everything she everything she read, and that that list kept getting longer uh, the more I um, the more research I did. Uh, I started to think that th there's a one thing that some of uh, the Wheatley family's descendants said about her was that they was that the Wheatleys um, let her keep a fire going at night and and a and a and a candle burning and so that so that may have been her time to write, but I, I started to think maybe she didn't sleep at all because um, maybe she was just one of those geniuses who and uh, the geniuses who also doesn't need to sleep for for whatever reason because the. The sheer learnedness, as well as uh, the subtlety and carefulness of her of her writing, and uh, uh, suggests someone who's not just a quick study who goes down one channel and, as some geniuses do, um, uh, can do one thing really, really well. She's experimenting in a number of poetic genres, and she's very and she's exper and then uh, as as you as she gets older she's experimenting in them and she is um writing about things and people who have had things happen to them that she knows about and she could have heard a lot of that word of mouth but it's also the rhetoric is influenced by things other people are writing and also by this uh by so much of anglo-american literature and greek and roman literature and translation as well as biblical literature so it, she's really uh, i i came what I, I was i can't say i was um I was I was shocked by it. I but uh, more and more I I was became convinced that oh uh, you know I'll never know all the things that she knew. I'm older than her than than I'm much older, but I will never know. And that's not just it's partly because she li she lived in her world and I don't live in the 18th century. Uh, but it's also just because she was that um, that brilliant, that much of a sponge, and that um, canny about seeking out. Uh, the sources that would enable her to do something that people could not deny was astonishing and challenging. You, you uh, frame her in this uh, world of Milton and Shakespeare her, as her literary environment, as she is um, looking to the, the forms and the format that Alexander Pope and others uh, provide as she's studying. And so as I was reading, it, I was struck by, struck by what may be some of her environs 
we are really thirsty for inter the uh, interiority uh, or the interior of the lives of people that have been hidden in the narrative. And particularly since that dominant narrative uh, wants to keep them in the background or not seen and not heard. But as you develop your text in this book, you give us this lens into more of her life that we are yearning for. You flesh the bone, in other words, that we know that she's a great poet. We know that she's done some extraordinary things, but what are they? What was her everyday life like? What was her environment politically? What was the environment that um, you pose as imperialism and the Amer American Revolutionary War and her relationship to um, those fights and, and what was happening around her? As uh, we think about her environment as a um, as one that seems to chide those who are in her environment to think about freedom and, and slavery and their relationship to it. Could you shed some light on that for us? Uh, and I could have I could have uh, answered your previous question uh, by going this by going this uh, route. But um, <laughs> one of the things that becomes apparent about um, when you read the uh, the newspapers that that, that uh, in Boston, as I did, is that she she's not alone. There's a a cohort of young Africans, uh, an, an uptick in importation, and overall more more Africans in Boston than we might assume, and that some of the earlier scholarship uh, presumed. And we're talking about. I think at least 10% of the population in the 1760s, maybe as much as, much as 15%. And because there's this, um, there are some, there are more ships coming in uh, from Africa and from the Caribbean uh, after the um, British start winning in the Seven Years' War and the, tr and, the, and the trade routes open back up and the British gain control of, uh, of two important ports in West Africa. Uh, we see uh, evidence of more um, more young people like her. And it becomes very clear that she is not the only one who uh, acculturated or assimilated quickly and turns out to be highly skilled and highly valued. We see this in the slave for sale ads uh, and, and we see it in, in um, uh, other other kinds of things in in the newspaper. So one of the arguments I make is that is that maybe is that we don't have to just completely try to imagine based on what we think the way we think slavery usually was. We have to keep all those things that we know about slavery in mind and not presume that Boston is different and they're really uh, it's really not the same as slavery elsewhere. It's still slavery. These people still exist under threat of sale. They still can't have families of their own. It's very, very difficult for them to do that because the way they are used in households um, actually makes them more that makes them uh, 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 more valuable if they're isolated very often. But uh, the um, this is also a, uh, a society that that do, that takes young people who don't have parents so orphans as well as as well as enslaved people and and assigns them to families where they will do unpaid labor. And that is that is a system. And uh, having enslaved people um, drives down the, the wages and the cost of of having of having other uh, uh, other people. So uh, the thing that, that that becomes very important is I don't I don't believe for a minute that she wasn't valuable as a laborer, as a laborer for the Wheatleys. And there there are various ways of, of thinking about why they engage in this experiment of educating her and how and, and what they think is going is uh, is, is going to be accomplished by encouraging her to do what she's doing. One of the things I think they're they're thinking of is that uh, actually it it um, will prove that um, will prove that slave that maybe uh, at a time when people are starting to criticize slavery, maybe it's not that bad, or it can be made Christian. It can be made better. That's one of the things I think is going on. But so Phyllis knows that Phyllis knows there are possibilities 
for um, pleasing people and maybe becoming free and maybe getting more autonomy within the system. But that said, there's also this there's also this collective phenomenon where it's it's undeniable that Africans are doing things that we tend to think that slaves couldn't do, but they're doing them and they're doing them for reasons. They're they're, they're getting they're not so much getting. I, I don't know if I want to say getting away with things, but they are pushing the boundaries of what of what we might consider to be because uh, to be acceptable enslaved behavior because it's in the interest of um of everybody for them to show those skills and do those things so she's not that much different from this um uh one person who was about her age who was referred to when he's when he's being put up for sale as having uh, a genius uh, a genius for a tradesman and he's only been there six months He's only he's come he's only been in he's only he's come over from from Africa six months and he's got a genius for a tradesman. Uh, uh, he so um, this is a uh, uh, a uh, a phenomenon, but nobody knows where it's going. Nobody knows if this is going to lead to uh, uh, a a kind of. Um, more people becoming free when they become adults. It's going to lead to the end of slavery, or does it actually reinforce the system as it exists and as it's evolving? So, um, one of I think one of the key th- the key starting points we need to understand about her environs is that um, is that is that she may have assumed. Uh, based on her, she could have gotten this from reading the Greek and Roman classics, but maybe but she would also get it if she, um, depending on how uh, how if she was eight years old when she came over. So so how much she knows about slavery in Africa, it may be very local, but she probably knows enough to know that some slaves become free, and that there's something, and that there's something. Uh, uh, so she's dealing with a situation where uh, there's this racialized American slavery that's hereditary. That's that's basically the worst kind of slavery that's ever existed but there may be possibilities for making it more like what slavery was in ancient times which was ubiquitous and harsh but not necessarily permanent or hereditary that's like so in terms of environs and what's shaping her I think that's the those are the most important facts that there are other people like her and that nobody knows where it's going and that's not just because some people believe slavery is wrong. They're trying to do something about it, which was the case, which started to be the case in the 1760s. Uh, but also because there are these counter examples that people know about and that they start to argue about. OK, well, uh, this brings up, as you said, you uttered the word possibilities as Phyllis sees herself having some possibility in her use uh, and, and I think about melancholy and death when I think of her use of elegy as a strategy for uh, moving and advancing her views and the lens through which we would see her um, uh, eulogize others and, and, and use this device to awaken us to much of her thought as she reveals in this, this elegizing of others, that um, it, it made me think as I was reading your words that she had her own sense of possibilities and immortality in actually rendering these elegies uh, of other people, that there was this idea of uh, Phyllis being equipped with uh, not only her identity as she announces her status on almost everything that she writes, um, but this ability to move into worlds here and beyond through the lives of other people and lifting them. So could you speak more to, to, to that and what you, you think of that as a strategy? I was really struck by that. Yeah, that's lovely. I think that um, there was something um, that leveled the playing field to be talking about death and the afterlife and to be playing this role that was so important uh, and doing it in a, and and when you read the elegies uh, from the beginning, but um, uh, as, as she writes more and more of them, they're really, they're, they're, um, they're almost bossy. 
in addition to being in addition to like they're often having a lot of praise for the people she's addressing and the and the and the departed their departed relatives or if it's someone who's like a minister a famous a minister or a, a public figure um the panegyric uh mode uh about that that there's something like there's she's claiming a lot of authority mm. Uh, and even telling people like not to over grieve because that's not what God wants. That's not what we're supposed to do. Now, that's not like it's not like an original idea for her to do that. But for her to claim the authority to do that, as as Wendy Roberts has argued so eloquently, she is taking the role increasingly in her po in her poems of a minister. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we would think of a poet poetry as a secular thing and min and and ministry over here as something different. But they actually overlap in terms of roles uh and that's why that genre was so familiar and exciting to people they overlap uh in part uh because um uh in worship and in religious literature there, there there's uh poetry is a big part of that uh they they're singing they're singing those traditional hymns uh but they're also uh, uh excited by some by new hymns like Isaac Watts for example uh is uh, is uh, very uh, uh, a uh, minister who wrote hymns that became that were were part of the uh, important part of the popular culture of the time it's actually revealing that she doesn't she she aims uh, a little higher that she doesn't write hymns of her own. Uh, she in terms in a in literary sense the 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 ones she writes are more often more ambitious than that uh, than 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 hymnody or if uh, if it's not too snobby to say it that way. But I think that's what people at the time would have recognized that she was doing something particularly uh, particularly ambitious. But the um, the thing I, one of the things that really when I uh, started to read Homer. And uh, notice these parallels and these 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 things that she's doing is that um, the there's uh, not an absolute line between the dead and the living mm. for ancient peoples, right? Mm. And when she's doing that, doing it in a very Christian way in those elegies, she is also doing something similar that would have that 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 she could have seen as, as uh, that is very much going on in that classical literature but also would have made sense to someone from west africa in the mid 18th century uh where um that where uh one lives in a relationship to the ancestors and um it is uh part of experience to think about and do things about the possibilities that the dead may still um have power uh and 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 be and and need to be um propitiated or spoken to or connected with and that so um th this is a this is another way in which um she's able to um the 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 these these ancient worlds uh uh the, the christian one and the uh secular greek and roman one uh, uh and the african one who her contemporaries in new england are uh, don't want to talk about and are going to be very condescending about and so she can't talk about them nevertheless she can um triangulate mm. and really be doing something that's not so foreign not turning herself into a, a a puppet of Anglo culture, but actually using those parts of it to keep doing what her mother may have done, what her mother may have done, or what she may have known and experienced. And I don't, I don't harp on it. I don't, I don't say it explicitly. I don't think uh, uh, again and again. But I think that that's that's part of that. I think that's. Uh, an essential part of what she's doing and her motivation for doing it and why she can do it, why she can do it so well. And I also think that um, there's a really winning universalism to it. That the way that she comes out of these connecting of these worlds uh, enables her to, without, I think, much sense of alienation, 
to feel like she has a she has a message and she has a a practice that uh even if even if she knows that everyone that everyone is always that she's she knows exactly who she is and and she knows that everyone is every time everyone reads any of her poetry they're they're not thinking of a the poet they're thinking of this poet they're thinking of this enslaved african young very young person nevertheless she's always reaching for the universal and i i find that um I, I, I think that that was something that was irresistible and I find irresistible. Okay. Well, um, thank you for that. I, um, as we ponder her ability to uh, negotiate the space of her home life, uh, there's a question about, you know, what was her home life like? But as you have iterated in your reading that the, she was able to have, um, candlelight at night and be able to write. So emancipation by book, emancipation by writing, by knowing language uh, seems to be uh, another of her strategies. In that regard, um, how would you depict what she did at home and yeah. how she was able to maintain um, some sense of freedom with that? Well, one of the one of the um, reasons I like to I started the book and like to read that um, uh, poem to the merchants Hussey and Coffin is that the preface the prefacing material to it uh, is the only contemporary testimony we have to to her doing anything in the house. We do not know what she did. There's so much we don't know, and so much I, we that that what her everyday life was like. But it, but that preface makes it very clear that she was waiting table. So she's, she works. She's a woman in the household and she's doing that labor. And the, the other thing we know was that, um, the other thing we know is that, that there's some from later uh, testimony that, that one of the descendants of the Wheatley, Wheatleys wrote in the early 19th century. Uh, it suggested that that she didn't work that 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 oh she didn't work that much but I don't believe I don't believe that I think that I, I, like if you if you I I don't think that I I think she was bought to be a substitute for the daughters in the household who had died and the two twins Mary and Nathaniel were eighteen years old and so they're going to have lives of their own soon uh, and so uh, Susanna Wheatley is getting older and she wants. She wants someone who is going to help around the house. And she I do think, though, that she one of the one of the themes in the book is that one of the things we can tell from things that she she that Phyllis did write about Susanna is that I think that Susanna Wheatley became emotionally dependent on Phyllis. So I like to think of, of her as doing a lot of emotional labor and she acknowledges being treated. Like a daughter as a member of the family, but it's also clear that there were limits to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it was a very intense environment where she is, uh, and that, that, that these people were entwined with each other and that um, while she is doing, she is doing the work that women that other women did and would have done in that household. She is also um, has uh, burdens and opportunities that come from uh, an, uh, uh, an appreciation of her emotional responsiveness, and, uh, and that's something I, I try to bring out of some of the poems and some of the some of the things that 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 were written at the time about about her about her about her and about um, about the Wheatleys. So uh, that's, um, but it's also very revealing that um, the first thing she, that that after uh, John Wheatley, uh, 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 Susanna Wheatley dies a couple months after she comes back from England, and John Wheatley dies a few years later, and uh, and right after John Wheatley dies, she doesn't get anything in the will, and she gets married and starts her own family. Mm -hmm. So her home life is extended by marrying uh, John Peters. Yes. Uh, can you tell us something about him and, and uh, that you were able to find as you uh, looked at his life? We, we know some of us have been uh, 
able to hear that she became married and it was marriage to John Peters, but that's not very much we know about him at all or that's mentioned. So were you able to find um, interesting um, uh, comments about him as you, as there, you- there, there are, there are, and they haven't gotten nearly as much play as they should. There were some earlier scholars who pushed back against the notion that some actually, the, some, some friends of Wheatley uh, uh, propagated, especially after she died, that that um, the marriage wasn't that the marriage uh, didn't serve her well, and that that was 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 one of the reasons why she came to a tragic end. I don't I don't believe that. Uh, there's there there's sufficient evidence to suggest that John Wheatley, that John Peters, is an extremely impressive guy. He uh, he's uh, he succeeds in business for a time. Uh, he um, uh, runs. He run, uh, th- We know a little bit m- more thanks to Nina Dayton's recent research. Uh, he he he's in a good position to inherit a inherit a farm that he grew up on. Um, he uh, he represents himself and other people in court. I uh, he uh, and th- th- there's several uh, people saying that he's um, that he's well read and just ex- and just extremely uh, impressive. So I think she picked that she picked a guy who um, was uh, the closest thing she could get to what she was to to what what she was like and and made an interesting choice. Now, like, but uh, during these years when they're married, the economy is in the toilet. I mean, there are very few opportunities and and things and they're they move, they're they're both in Boston and in rural towns and they're they're in, in several ways they're in the they're first they're in the right place and then they're in the wrong place uh, at the at the wrong time and uh, things don't work out very well uh, but um, I, I think I think she made a very a very interesting and revealing choice in marrying marrying John Peters and it's only it's actually only our presumptions that 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 that. Um, uh, no African American men had prospects uh, in in the 1770s or 80s, which isn't true. Uh, that leads us to think that um, get that that um, things were inevitably going to go uh, um, to go south in in their in their marriage or or in or in her life uh, or economically. Which uh, they were married and did they have children? We only have. Um, that uh, Margaret o- Margaret Odell's testimony on this that she um, that she had uh, it's ambig and it's ambiguous uh, it's uh, the, there's very there's very little testimony it does appear that she had uh, at least one and as many as three children and it seems that they didn't survive her and I don't we don't know whether uh, how long they lived uh, there's some there. Margaret O'Dell said that that she was sick and her children died with her while John Peters was in debtor's prison in 1784. Th- there were that that's not a very unusual thing to be in debtor's prison. That actually means like people who were in debtor's prison, that means they actually had money that somebody's trying to recover. Like they get arrested because then somebody's trying to trying to put them in jail so that then somebody else will bail them out and and pay their debts for them and take over their debt or that their relatives or that somehow they're hiding their they're hiding their money and if they're in, in if you put them in prison long enough like that that you'll get paid it's a it's um there's a wonderful book about this by um the legal historian um uh uh bruce um uh, uh i'm sorry his name is it's crazy i've known him for 20 years his name is escaping me right now but uh it's called republic of debtors um uh so uh so there's really um not much uh, reason to uh, uh, dwell on, I think, on 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 the, that that un- that unfortunate uh, outcome. Okay. Well, um, one of the the questions that I have has to do with the people that you call the young Africans who were savvy and cosmopolitan, and the formation of what was called "quote unquote" their committee this black abolitionist group that um, Phyllis was a part of. It it is uh, assumed that she was not in her resistance, that she was not very radical uh, by those who were looking at her from the lens of a a 1960s uh, 
uh, a black revolution, but from the uh, standpoint of the, the 18th century and what was possible in terms of her challenge to Puritans and Christianity and them being involved with slavery. Um, she was a part of this abolitionist group that would include people like Prince Hall and uh, Caesar Sider and, and others. Um, uh, what was, was there anything that you found? I know that they petitioned, um, they used this vice of petition and letters and were, had intersectionality with indigenous people like Reverend Slocum. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, well, I'm really glad. I'm really glad you brought that up, especially for a Boston uh, audience. Um, there, we there's not a we there's not a direct link in the sense of uh, that we know that she knew though we don't know I don't I don't have evidence that she knew them specifically or that she met with them. But what is clear is that the language that they're using in their petitions and the way they are going about cultivating authority and engaging in parallel activities to the committees of correspondence, I argue, um, she's using a lot of the same language in her, in the letters we have and and in her poems. And so I try to, I, I argue that like, that there is this moment in 1770. 273, 74, where there, there's this ramping up of anti-slavery activity, and it is as much led by the Africans as it is by um, by by some of the the white patriots and Tories who, uh, for uh, for various reasons, are taking different positions and are thinking about the relationship between the the protest movement, the the um, the uh, patriot movement and uh, the fate of Africans. And so what what I argue is that these these developments are reinforcing each other. And in a way, it's in a way the what Africans are doing and the way they are seizing upon the the language of freedom and slavery and making specific arguments about the kinds of arguments patriots are making and appro and appropriating them uh, 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 as as Wheatley is doing also, that actually raises the stakes of of the entire uh uh imperial controversy and the 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 thing that that's so rarely noticed as a factor but i think is so important is that uh you know we we tend to want to study the sam adamses and the and the people who oh how did they lead this movement that led to independence how did they preserve their liberty how did they uh give us the american nation but we do, so we don't pay attention to the fact that they're being criticized as hypocrites for keeping slaves while they're while they're talking about freedom and their worries that the British are going to enslave them by taking away their property and their ability to govern themselves. So uh, and that Caesar Sarter and Phyllis Wheatley and Prince Hall, they know this and they are intervening in such a way that that raises the stakes and leads to this to be a three-way co uh, uh, a conversation with multiple sides and that all that is is related to the fact that Wheatley goes over to England because the the in Boston that can't can't publish her book because it's embarrassing in Boston and uh whereas it, for, at first it had seemed possible she goes over to England and they publish it there and and even the most the most critical first review says uh can you believe these Boston people like you know like the uh the, that they would keep someone like this enslaved and this is the critical review this isn't the one that's saying she's amazing this is the one that's saying you know maybe she's not that original but can you believe these Americans like like uh better you know like uh uh the, you know, hang, talking all about their liberty trees while uh, keeping someone like this enslaved. So the the what so uh, the um, that situation both uh, emboldens her, but it also raises the stakes and makes what she's doing more more dan more dangerous and more. Um, uh, it's not it, it, it like so she hedges her bets in terms of in terms of uh, 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 she's she's still praising Governor Gage. A lot later than than um, General Gage and Governor Gage, he's both at the time. Uh, uh, a lot later than a lot of other people are, and so um, what we see here is is really the pattern that uh, Benjamin Quarles identified so eloquently in 1961, where he said, where he when he said that uh, during the war, uh, uh, but beginning in 1775, uh, African Americans fought on fought for whichever side they thought would gain them more liberty. Okay. 
<laughs> and that sometimes meant switching sides or hedging their bets. But uh, uh, so one of the things that becomes very apparent is that the Patriots are 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 not are embarrassed and and they do. You see some more support for anti-slavery measures on the part of Sam Adams, for example. But at the same time, they're they're extremely worried about the British enlisting Africans even before the war. Okay. So there's uh, so that and that that and I I I show one of the I I think one of the original some of one of the fruits of my research was to show that that is true at the time of the Boston massacre. It's true earlier. It's true later, and that 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 creates a volatile situation, and also ones that one that means that the the activism of the Africans has to be very very careful. Yes, well, it's, it's both a very for... public thing, but also a very it has to be very subtle. And so she's doing it in a particularly women's way. She cannot write uh, petitions and take them to the legislature the way those guys are. But she's doing something parallel in the realms that a woman can. Why doesn't she write a slave narrative that like uh, makes it all clear? It, the genre doesn't e doesn't even exist yet. Mm -hmm. It's not even an option. Nobody's asking her to do that. But poet, but po but somehow she figures out that she can that there are things she can do with poetry. Well, uh, with that, we are out of time. Unfortunately, we could probably go on for another two years with the research that you've done in this wonderful book. But I tried to incorporate, and I will tell our, our audience that we appreciate your questions. I tried to incorporate and wrap some of those in the questions that I was asking. And we know that we never have enough time, uh, but that we really appreciate you being here and being present. And please look in the chat for some references to uh, the BPL resources that we have that were mentioned as um, David was talking with us. We wanna really thank David for sharing what your research over many years has uh, brought us in this level of understanding more about Phyllis and literary culture and her contributions to the American canon. I just wanna say, get the book. If you wanna know more and your questions can be answered in here and it is delightful reading. So thank you so much, David. Thank you, Lamerchi. Thank you. Thank, thank you both for sharing what is known and what is unknown about this remarkable woman and her time. Um, you've offered us some really great insight. Um, and thank you, Professor Waldstreicher, for joining us tonight. A reminder to our audience, copies of The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley are available from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, as Lamerchi said, you may think you know Boston at the time of the American Revolution, but if you want to fully understand the perspective of enslaved of peoples, of women, of writers at the time. Um, what uh, Doctor, uh, what Professor Waldstreicher is bringing up about um, arming African Americans um, both here and in South Carolina, what was going on behind the scenes is really, really fascinating. Uh, but now back to tonight, our many thanks to our conversationalists and to our presenting partners. Um, we also thank the GBH Forum Network for all they do behind the scenes to support tonight's event. And to the audience out there in Zoom land, thank you for joining us, for listening to Professor Waldstreicher and Lamerchi. We all learned a lot. We're grateful to you for tuning in, for your questions, and for your interest in history. We wish everyone a very good evening. Thank you.